March 26, 2024, News Report 1. On March 26, 2024, local time in the United States, the Singapore container ship Western Jiang container ship Dallaheo collided with the Francis Scott Key Bridge in Baltimore, Maryland, causing the entire Key Bridge to collapse. Currently, more than 20 people and several cars have fallen into the Patapsco River under the Key Bridge. According to Sky News, based on video footage and maritime tracking data at the scene, Dallaheo had lost power before the collision with the bridge. When the accident happened, Dallaheo was approaching the key bridge and suddenly lost power, emitting black smoke. Subsequently, all the lights on the ship went out, and Dallaheo lost power for the second time. Finally, after colliding with the piers of the key bridge, the key bridge began to collapse, and Dallaheo was hit and sank by the bridge deck, exploding and catching fire. The Baltimore Fire Department said that two people had been rescued, one of whom was injured, and efforts are underway to rescue those who fell into the river. The river temperature is only 10 degrees Celsius, posing a life-threatening risk to those who fell into the water. Dallaheo container ship is 300 meters long and weighs 110,000 tons. The key bridge is named after the author of the U.S. National Anthem, with a total length of 2.6 kilometers, spanning the Patapsco River, and is an important transportation hub connecting the port of Baltimore. The accident has caused all highways passing through the key bridge to be closed, while the port of Baltimore handles 21,000 containers per week. Bulk commodities such as coal, sugar, and cars for import and export on the U.S. East Coast are usually shipped through the Port of Baltimore. Shipping consultancy firms say that the collapse of the Key Bridge means that ships entering Baltimore can only be put on hold and cannot dock, and repairing the Key Bridge will take at least several months. Transferring cargo from the Port of Baltimore to other ports will also face considerable difficulties, but this may be a feasible solution. News Report 2 U.S. Secretary of State Blinken and Vietnamese Foreign Minister Pham Binh Minh held talks in Washington on March 25. Pham Binh Minh's visit to the U.S. is from March 23 to 29. The U.S. State Department issued a statement saying that the two sides discussed ways to expand cooperation in key areas, including diversifying the supply chain of the chip ecosystem, education and culture, security, and human rights. They also discussed shared priorities, including strengthening the chip ecosystem, education and culture, security, and human rights, and building a free, open, interconnected, and prosperous Indo-Pacific region, promoting stability and prosperity in the South China Sea. Blinken said that expanding cooperation with Vietnam in key areas demonstrates U.S. commitment to the Indo-Pacific region and U.S.-Vietnam relations. Pham Binh Minh told Blinken that Vietnam values its relationship with the United States, which includes promoting high-level political exchanges as well as cooperation in trade, investment, and chips. It is worth noting that in September 2023, U.S. President Biden visited Vietnam, elevating the relationship between the two countries to a comprehensive strategic partnership. Cooperation in the chip industry is a core content of the upgrade of U.S.-Vietnam relations. News Report 3 Reuters reported that Chinese President Xi Jinping will meet with American business leaders in Beijing on March 27, as a follow-up to his meeting with American investors in San Francisco in November 2023. At that time, Xi Jinping did not visit the United States but attended the APEC summit in Los Angeles. According to the report, the investor dinner at the time was attended by more than 400 people. The meeting on March 27 in Beijing was proposed by Greenberg, CEO of Chubb Insurance Group. Currently, the meeting includes executives from Pfizer, FedEx, and other companies, as well as the chairman of the National Committee on U.S.-China Relations and the National Committee on U.S.-China Trade, both of which are Chinese lobbying groups. Bloomberg reported that U.S. corporate executives have received written invitations, although the invitations do not mention Xi Jinping's name, there is a possibility that he will not attend. The report pointed out that the meeting was not arranged during the Development High-Level Forum, mainly to separate it from the forum. 
The development forum was held on March 24 and 25, with over 100 foreign corporate executives attending. However, according to the New York Times, this year's development high-level forum canceled the Prime Ministerial Roundtable, leading some foreign corporate executives to leave on the evening of the 24th and miss the activities on the 25th. The report pointed out that Chinese senior leaders' participation in public events is decreasing, and even if they do attend, it is for formal propaganda purposes, and foreign corporate executives are less interested in participating in these events. News Report 4 Xinhua News Agency reported that Chinese Premier Li Keqiang held talks with International Monetary Fund, IMF, Managing Director Kristalina Georgieva on March 26. Li Keqiang said that from a long-term perspective, China's economy has institutional, market, industrial, human resources, and innovation advantages. He emphasized that China's long-term fundamentals have not changed and will steadfastly open up to the outside world. Georgieva tweeted that the meeting was fruitful and discussed China's economic and global economic outlook. She praised China's reforms for seizing the opportunity of high-quality growth and expressed a desire to further deepen the partnership between the IMF and China. In addition, according to Xinhua News Agency, Vice Premier He Lefeng also held talks with Georgieva on March 25. He Lefeng said that China's economy is stable and improving. In addition, People's Bank of China Governor Pan Gongsheng also held talks with Georgieva on March 26, and Pan Gongsheng said that China's economy is stable and improving. Georgieva is currently in Beijing to attend the High Level Development Forum. Although she has been polite in her speeches at the forum, she has also made some demands. First, she called on China to reposition its economic policies to deal with the real estate market crisis and promote consumption and productivity. Second, she called on China to take decisive action to complete unfinished housing construction and reduce the debt risk of local governments. Third, she emphasized that relying on domestic consumption is key to achieving high-quality growth. News Report 5 The BOA Forum for Asia opened at the BOA Asian Museum in Hainan on March 26 and will last for four days. The conference announced that more than 2,000 political, business, and academic figures from 60 countries attended the forum. According to the schedule of the talks, the BOA Forum annual meeting did not hold an opening ceremony on March 26, but instead arranged a press conference, followed by several subforums and a welcome banquet. March 27 is scheduled for more subforums throughout the day. The opening ceremony is scheduled for the 28th, with Chinese leaders such as Xi Jinping and Li Keqiang absent, and instead attended by Zhao Leji. Chairman of the National People's Congress, who delivered the keynote speech. Foreign leaders attending this year's BOA Forum include Kazakh President Tokayev and Cambodian Prime Minister Hun Senator. Former Taiwanese Vice President Annette Liu attended the BOA Forum last year but did not attend this year. Zhang Huisheng, Chairman of the Cross Strait Common Market Foundation, representing the BOA Forum, did not set up a roundtable meeting for entrepreneurs from both sides of the strait, making this year's forum of lower specification and arranging somewhat strangely. In addition, the BOA Forum Institute issued a report on March 26, predicting that Asia's economic growth this year will be around 4.5%, with East Asia growing at 4.3% and South Asia at 5.8%. However, if the Chinese government does not participate again, the BOA Forum may lose its influence. News Report 6 According to France's public broadcaster, Russian Security Council Secretary Patrushev was asked by reporters on March 26 whether Ukraine was behind the concert hall attack. Patrushev said that the attack was undoubtedly carried out by Ukraine. Moscow's concert hall was subjected to a terrorist attack on the 23rd, which the Islamic State has claimed responsibility for. However, the Russian government has consistently claimed that Ukraine is responsible for the attack, but has not provided evidence. Russia's Sputnik news agency reported that Russian President Putin held a public meeting with government officials on the evening of March 25, admitting for the first time that the terrorist attack on the concert hall was carried out by Islamic extremists. 
Putin still pointed the finger at Ukraine, saying that he wanted to find out the mastermind behind the attack. The Russian opposition criticized the government for ignoring the terrorist threat due to its invasion of Ukraine, and in fact, Russia has always been a target of Islamic terrorist attacks. On September 1, 2004, Chechen separatist militants stormed a school in Moscow, killing 330 people, including 186 children. Additionally, the official Russian television reported that survivors of the Moscow Concert Hall terrorist attack retrieved their personal belongings from the Concert Hall on March 25, which were packed in numbered white, blue, and green plastic bags. News Report 7 According to the official website of the Taiwan Presidential Office, President Tsai Ing-wen went to Ilan on Tuesday, March 26, morning to preside over the commissioning ceremony of Taiwan's high-efficiency naval vessels Anji and Wanjiang. These Tuo River-class missile patrol vessels are independently developed by Taiwan and have a displacement of only 700 tons, with a cruising speed of up to 40 knots and equipped with Sung Fong-2 and Sung Fong-3 anti-ship missiles. These small, high-speed, and highly maneuverable vessels are not easily detected and are primarily used for asymmetric warfare against enemy warships and aircraft carriers. Taiwan has been developing Tuo River vessels since 2012, with the first one delivered in 2014 and mass production beginning. The first phase plans to build six vessels, all of which have been delivered. President Tsai Ing-wen said at the delivery ceremony that Taiwan has steadfastly implemented national defense autonomy in recent years, demonstrating Taiwan's ability and determination in potential national defense construction. News Report 8 Radio Free Asia reported that the High Court of Hong Kong announced on March 26 that Hong Kong media tycoon Yu Pinhai has gone bankrupt. According to reports, the Bank of Construction of Hong Kong applied to the High Court of Hong Kong for Yu Pinhai's bankruptcy in October 2023. Yu Pinhai owes the Bank of Construction of China 416 million Hong Kong dollars in loans, holds 59% of the equity of South China Holdings, and the equity of Hong Kong's largest online media Hong Kong 01. The market value of these equities is estimated at 323 million Hong Kong dollars. Yu Pinhai took over Min Bao from Louis Cha in 1991, but according to the Hong Kong Economic Journal, he had a criminal record while studying in Canada and resigned as chairman of Min Bao. He also founded another newspaper called Modern Daily, which closed after one year of operation. In 1994, he founded the Zhongtian Channel of the Communication Television, which independently reported on the death of Deng Xiaoping, but after three years of operation, it lost $100 million and was eventually sold to China Aerospace. Yu Pinhai also acquired Asia Weekly and Duoway News Network, but Duoway News Network closed in 2022, and the editorial staff transferred to the Dadi Group under Hong Kong 01. He invested in the Chinese film industry, owning the Dadi Cinema and Urban Cinema brands, and released films such as Confucius and Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon. News Report 9 The Taiwan Taoyuan District Prosecutor's Office has filed charges against Chinese tourists Han Wei and Xiao Lei Lei for theft on an airplane. The prosecution pointed out that in January this year, the Taiwan Aviation Police received a report from a passenger that 60,000 new Taiwan dollars in cash had been stolen on the plane, disguised as a stack of masks. After an investigation by the Taiwan Aviation Police, Han Wei and Xiao Lei Lei were identified. According to reports, when Han Wei and Xiao Lei Lei flew from Hong Kong to Taiwan on February 3, Taiwan Aviation Police dispatched officers to gather evidence on the flight. After the plane took off, Han Lei stood up in the economy class, pretending to look for luggage, and stole passengers' belongings and credit cards. Xiao Lei Lei stole 15,000 new Taiwan dollars from the luggage of other passengers. The officers captured their every move on camera. After the flight landed, the two were arrested. The investigation found that Han Lei and Xiao Lei Lei had committed multiple crimes on flights in Hong Kong, Taiwan, and Singapore. 
Taiwan Aviation Police suspect that the two are members of an airborne theft group and are further investigating. News Report 10 According to Reuters, on March 26, the Pakistani police issued a notice stating that a Chinese construction team from the Ghazhuba Group working on a dam project in northwestern Pakistan was hit by a suicide bombing, resulting in the deaths of five engineers from the group and a Pakistani driver. The notice stated that a suicide attacker drove a car filled with explosives into the convoy. At the time, the convoy was heading to Islamabad, the capital, from Desu in Khyber Pakhtunkhwa province. The Ghazhuba Group is currently building a hydroelectric power station in Desu, and there is currently no organization claiming responsibility for the attack. The report also mentioned that in 2021, there was a bus explosion in Desu that killed 13 people, including 9 Chinese. After the attack, work on the Desu hydroelectric project was suspended for several months. Voice of America reported that Chinese state-owned enterprises have many belt and road projects in Pakistan, but local Pakistanis are dissatisfied with these projects. They believe that Chinese projects have not given Pakistanis the benefits they deserve, as most job opportunities are taken up by Chinese people. Local Pakistanis seek the support of independent ethnic armed groups and often attack Chinese projects. News Report 11 On March 26, the Hubei Provincial Court sentenced five people involved in football corruption cases. According to Lianhe Zaobao, Chen Shiyuan, the former chairman of the Chinese Football Association, was sentenced to life imprisonment for bribery and had all his personal property confiscated. Chen Shiyuan accepted bribes of 81 million yuan, of which 4 million were not actually obtained. Yu Hongcheng, the secretary of the Chinese Football Association, was sentenced to 13 years in prison and fined 2 million yuan for accepting bribes of 22.54 million yuan. Chen Yongliang, the executive deputy secretary general of the Football Association, was sentenced to 14 years in prison and fined 1.934 million yuan for accepting bribes of 19.34 million yuan. Dong Zheng, the general manager of the Chinese Super League, was sentenced to 8 years in prison and fined 22 million yuan for accepting bribes of 22 million yuan. Lu Lei, the director of the competition department of the Wuhan Football Center, was sentenced to two years and six months in prison and fined 520,000 yuan for accepting bribes of 520,000 yuan. News Report 12 According to the Associated Press, Chinese Christian pastor Chao Sanxiang was detained in 2017 after returning from missionary work in Myanmar. In 2018, a Chinese court sentenced Chao Sanxiang to seven years in prison for the so-called crime of organizing others to illegally cross the border. After being released from prison on March 4 this year, Chao Sanxiang found that his household registration had been cancelled. Chao Sanxiang said that in 2006, while he was preaching in China, the police went to his hometown in Changsha and took his household registration book, saying they would update the information and return it later. However, he later found that his name had been deleted, losing his identity. Without a household registration in China, there is no identity card, and Chao Sanxiang cannot buy train tickets or receive medical services. Chao Sanxiang is outraged by the Chinese government's restrictions on him, believing it is a violation of human rights.